थैंक यू First of all, thank you so much, Yoki, for joining us here in the Woods community. We're so thrilled and honored to have you here. It's terrific. Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm extremely honored to be here. So thank you for inviting me. Yeah. yeah. Um, so as Margot said, uh, you know, you're probably most well known for your role as the chief technology officer at Nest, where you built and designed the learning algorithms that both kept people comfortable in their homes and as well helped them save a lot of energy. So. That was a terrific contribution, but you started your career in a really, uh, really interesting way as a, as a top-rated tennis player in Japan, mm -hmm. is that right? Uh, and came to the U.S. to train uh, here and sustained some injuries and then decided, hey, I'm good at math and physics, so I might just go to Berkeley. So that was a terrific backup plan, don't you think? Uh, so yeah. uh, Lucky there. Yeah, totally. Uh, and while you were at Berkeley, uh, you got interested in robotics and you decided to try to build a, um, a robot to play tennis with. Mm -hmm. So how did that go? Did the robot beat you? You know, no, not yet. <laughs> well, I'm getting worse, so maybe the robot will beat me now, but yeah. Uh, I didn't know anything else but robots, so, you know, anything else by tennis, so that's what I figured I'd do. Cool. Yeah. Uh, and then you went on to MIT into the program there and started to look at the intersection of neuroscience and robotics. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could share a little bit with um, the WIDS community here what, how you made that connection and how you then applied that uh, in your work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, starting from building a tennis buddy just because that's all I knew, and then to going to MIT and having the opportunity to see the depth of machine learning at that time is nothing like what you guys are doing now. But um, and then you know felt that limitations of what machine learning can do, and if artificial intelligence was limited, then natural intelligence has to be understood for us to build artificial intelligence. So that's how I started taking neuroscience classes, and then I get addicted. Cool. Yeah. Well, to the benefit of a lot of people, I would think. Uh, so now you you founded co-founded Google X. You were at Nest, and now you um, are a VP at Google Health. And Google Health, as we understand it, is sort of getting new leadership and going to make another push into these areas. Investments have been across a wide range of things so far. Uh, and I know you can't tell us anything about the strategy mm -hmm. just yet, but we would be delighted to hear sort of how you chose that as your next adventure. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I'm, I usually follow my mission and then passion, and then as I started to follow it, it, I wouldn't necessarily say like, I landed in this job and then is this a new chapter? It's, that's not how it is at all. For me, I've been you know, pushing on the same dream of making sure that people get to live healthy life all the time, which includes home. So that's why I was on Nest, I wanted to care for people inside the home too, and on the world around it. So I've been, actually kind of doing the same job, working with the same set of people, and then Nest became part of Google again, and then Google decided to invest in health, and then there was a new health organization that was born, and here I am. <laughs> That's just yeah. perfect. Yeah. And in reading some of your bio, um, there was a period, uh, I guess after MIT, when you, um, you did a startup, and you were focused on uh, stroke victims. Mm -hmm and trying to build robotics in the home that would solve the problem of a lot of stroke victims are elderly and they have trouble getting to their physical therapy. I'd love to hear a little bit about that. I'm sure the group here would love to hear how you approached that problem sure. back then uh, and what worked and what didn't work so well. Yeah, so I think it was actually two generations after uh, MIT time. So at, after MIT, I became a professor at Carnegie Mellon, and then after that, I had kids, and then I had to move to, uh, no, I didn't have to, I guess, I moved to the West Coast. And uh, during that time, I had this itch that I can scratch in academia, which is to touch people who need help every day at that time. Um, I was writing journal papers, right? Like many of the academic people we know, that's the criteria that I, you, know, you have to meet, and that's what I did. Um, so I thought, aha, uh -huh. uh, the robots that I'm building in my lab can change how people learn to move again, thought, great, perfect, I can rehabilitate people. The need for people who had stroke isn't to get rehabilitated in the hospital and over and over better, but they can't even get to the hospital, so can we do this at home? Um, I thought it was a brilliant idea. 
I started a company as a professor on the side. Um, it taught me, like one, I was never exposed to Silicon Valley yet. I knew nothing about starting a company. Um, I just knew the technology. I thought that was good enough to get started. I also thought that it was good enough to get started with the little time that I had on the side of doing research. So I didn't dedicate everything. I just had people who were dedicated, but I wasn't spending enough time on it either. So there were a lot of things that was going wrong to begin with, but the idea was good. Um, and once um, we got started and we started thinking about installing to people's homes, very first thing, so the robot was great, the algorithm was great, it was combining with the neuroscience and the machine learning, installed it. Uh, first thing they asked, uh, does that have to work on Wi-Fi? Like, yeah, we don't have one. It's like, oh. And that kept happening over and over. And realized that, at, you know, this is 2007, could it be? Yeah, around then. And in the last year, you know, 12 years, we made a huge stride in having more Wi Fi. But still, there are, you know, significant portions of the country, and as well as in the world, as well as those people who are older, had stroke, tend to just not have Wi Fi. And then seriously, like our company became about that. And that's kind of where we ended up folding or at least postponing for the time being. So a little bit ahead of its time, <laughs> we have to say, right? Uh, so fast forward all the Nest and connected devices in the home and the connected home and everybody has Wi-Fi. You know, it's sort of like, you know, the necess necessary is food and shelter, Wi-Fi these days. So um, are you going to get a chance, do you think, to realize that dream now that the infrastructure is there and uh, you can connect some dots in your career, perhaps? Absolutely. And then, you know, I, I, I mean, it's great that the world has shifted in the right direction. Um, you know, just doing Nest, even starting from thermostat, I've always had that in the back of my mind of how do I get to the point of taking care of people in their home better? IoT was sort of a hype word that it wasn't actually happening at that time yet. And then entering from a thermostat in a very user-focused way allowed the whole industry to really bubble up in the right places. So is it ready now? It's almost ready. Um, you know, is that going to be my next thing? I'm not sure. I think I'd like to do that at some point. And then, you know, if anybody wants to collaborate, let me know. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's, and then also CMS has, rule has changed in such a way that there's now reimbursement around rehabilitation. Uh, it's, it's so important. That's terrific. Yeah. That's terrific. So uh, this morning, Padma Warrior was talking about the big trends that are going to happen in 2019 and going forward. And she talked a lot about the connected car. But she said the number one thing besides that is really innovation in healthcare, generally. Uh, just wondering if you had to pick one problem in healthcare that data and analytics specifically uh, machine learning algorithms and so on um, could help fix. Uh, what would that be? You know, there's I'm, probably 20 problems. Yeah, <laughs> so I think there are probably you guys know the, all the obvious ones. So uh, you know, like better diagnosis and all those. Just like there are a lot of things. I'm going to say probably a couple of different dimensions that by doing this for a while that I've been exposed to that to me is a data science problem, but not enough people are tackling on. One is true connection to health outcomes. So we're doing this so that people have measurable true health differences. And often, maybe we get distracted with different kind of technology or you know, some hone into it and then you realize that it's not just about the outcome. It might be about efficiency. It might be about the cost reduction of different parts of it. But I just really would like the focus to really be around the outcomes. The other one? Um, is also kind of a weird thing to talk about with from the data science, but it's absolutely important is engagement. I think data scientists are the ones who are going to make that big difference. The reason why a lot of people are not healthy is because they're not engaged with healthcare. They're not engaged with how to remain healthy so that slowly things brew for the, you know, in the 20 years time span, a little bit over, you know, obese, a, you know, a little bit too much salt intake, a little bit less exercise, a little bit less sleep, and then all those things accumulate and eventually become this chronic disease, heart conditions, diabetes, that you can't recover that well, you know, that well from. So I think those are the places where engagement early on connecting with the outcome long-term from now in that very urgent way. 
And I think that would be really interesting data science. That is a great, great answer. And you know, you talked um, in your work at Nest about people want to save energy, but they don't necessarily think to turn down the thermostat. And that one of the goals you set out to achieve using machine learning and algorithms was to make that easy, mm -hmm. to make that simple, uh, which yeah. obviously you, you achieved that. So um, I guess you would want to probably apply that thinking in some way to, people want to be healthy, they want to do the right thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, you know, what's the interesting, when I was at Nest, is, you know, if I asked a whole room full of people and said, who wants to save energy? Everybody, of course, is like, duh, like, of course I want to save energy. But then I said, so how many people turned down the temperature when they left their homes? Like, very little people. Um, so that, you know, n behavioral, day-to-day -day behavioral change sometimes is really hard. Can some of the places humans a little bit lazy about or forgetful on, are those the places where a machine can come in and augment? You know, I always picture an in-yang picture where there's a human and a machine and then us together create this holistic who we actually really want to be. And I know it feels that Nest Thermostat was trying to satisfy that in a way that also still doesn't get in the way of, you know, people's needs. People want to be in control, not to have something else be in control of them. Yeah, and I, I remember reading also um, when you talked about the rehabilitation work that you said if you overdial the algorithms, I'm probably not saying this right, you can correct me, but... Uh, if you provide too much support, it has a negative effect. If you provide not enough support, you don't get the results and so on. So this, mm -hmm. this you talk about the yin-yang, is that yeah. part of this theme? And uh, it, it really is. So, so um, the thermostat, there's an example that was kind of a big learning moment for Nest. So it, Nest started in 2010, and then we were shipping the very first product in 2011. And two, three months before the actual day that all those devices were gonna be in Target and Best Buy and then, you know, beautiful box and then ship. Um, we had a field trial with, in homes and to see if this crazy, amazing learning thermostat, machine learning with, you know, data-based science uh, to save energy is gonna work in real homes. So we gave, you know, beta systems and then started field trials. And this is, we were shipping in this fall, so this was in the summer. So we picked really, really hot places in like Texas to do this. And we realized that those people that we had cranked up the machine learning, uh, the results said that they were wasting more energy than saving energy. And we're like, what did we do wrong? So we had to really go dive and then deep dive and understand Wait, the, what did the algorithm go wrong? No, the algorithm was executing perfect. So what is it? It turns out to be dealing with and fighting with the human nature, human personality, human rebelliousness. So what <laughs> happened was that when people put air conditioning at a certain temperature and leave, they actually had at that moment intention to want to have that comfortable temperature. And when something else took over, which was not in their control, that was trying to save energy, it annoyed the hell out of them. <laughs> so they said, you know what, I set it to 74 degrees thinking to save energy, but forget you, I'm gonna crank it down to 72 degrees because that's more comfortable. So there was this funny pull push happen with the data machine learning and then a human, and then we lost. And seriously, this was like two, three months before we were gonna ship, and then we had this, you know, oh Jesus moment. Um, and then had to think, how do we change machine learning in such a way that now it is a partner, it is a collaborator, in the background it is enhancing who they want to be. It's okay as Nest, we don't have to save energy from every single person. There are people who are willing to be a partner and want something to help them save energy and they'll be glad that the partner's there. Some buy it because it's beautiful, they like to have this on the wall and they don't care to save energy. Let's understand how to understand what that partner is like and then let's allow them to be who they want to be. And so we changed the algorithms and then shipped it, and it was a huge success. Well, that's terrific. Well, I hope you can apply that then in these health applications, uh, that same learning around if I need to lose weight or I need to stay on a drug protocol or and I know it's good for me, but 
uh, as you said, fine-tuning the algorithms to really work in a compatible way with, mm -hmm. with the humans is probably going to be the linchpin there. I would it really think. is. And I think, you know, there's, there are so many ways that you can talk about giving advice for people to do those things. And then there's a very much, like if there's a person, like you're, you know, I don't know, a coach, human coach, who cares about you, who checks out on your metrics and then says, Oh, yeah, you ate that cake last night. That was probably not the best idea. Um, but let's make an effort together. Turns out when there's a human element with empathy and all of that, that seems to really work. And, you know, things like Weight Watchers, those things have a lot to do with going to brick and mortar and then having a human in an interaction, right? Like those models have always worked in the past. Then we're starting this brand new area where your phone says, ding, why did you eat that cake? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, it's a very different world that we're kind of trying to take the, you know, the people to. And those are slightly less effective at this time. So how do we make this bridge? You know, so I think that's, that's so interesting. That's what I said about the health outcome and an engagement. If we can solve that through data science, I think it's going to be fascinating. That is a terrific problem and would be a really great, great goal. Mm -hmm. Well, shifting gears just a little bit, you know, we've seen industry after industry, what we call disruption. You know, tech, technology players, people who are using data science and smarter ways of doing things have come in into multiple industries and essentially replaced a lot of the traditional competitors. Um, last time I was on the stage, I was with Caitlin Smallwood, who's out there from Netflix, and they certainly have had a big impact on the entertainment industry. It's true. Uh, just uh, curious what your thoughts are in healthcare. We have all these experts saying healthcare is the next big frontier for this kind of disruption to occur. There are examples in China, for example. I had the opportunity to meet with the head of the venture group for Ping An, which is a mm. financial services company that has very great technology and data and analytic capability. And they entered the healthcare segment and they, in five years, got 230 million customers on their platform and are doing facial recognition and all this stuff to actually improve outcomes. So that's been a big success story. And obviously, the landscape there is very different. The conditions there are very different than they are here. But just interested from um, you know, your perspective, uh, how near in you think that kind of uh, change might be uh, here in the US and, hmm. and in Europe and other places? Yeah, in terms of the timing, I mean, healthcare is a giant beast, right? And then, in the US, it's I think 80% of GDP, you know, $3.68 trillion been spent. Um, it's, so trying to flip that thing upside down and suddenly make a difference, it's just not gonna happen. So it's gonna take time. We have to make crazy amount of investment. And also actually, one thing everybody says, like even if I made 1% of that $3 trillion, that's a really, really good company, so I should start one. But that's, <laughs> don't look at it that way, but I think we all need to sort of bite at it from different angles because it's, it's a monster, it's gonna take, I actually think that by the time we feel like, wow, we are making a difference, it's gonna be 10 years from now, right? I think, and all, uh, I think we're gonna fail a lot, and I think it's okay. Uh, we have to experiment, we have to, and then I think we have to have a safety net and then not punish those who are failing and then just let those try to get to that point. Um, but yeah, but it's gonna happen, it has to happen. I think the future leaders in this area will be, tripod, you know, which is going to be the tech company, the hospitals, and then that payer that, you know, the insurance companies. I think those, you know, up until now was a lot of the, t the other two sectors, but I think tech will absolutely give that lift. And, but it has to be a synergy. It can't be like tech company dominating. It's not one of those. I'm sure that's comforting to the incumbents. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So, um, this morning, we also had a couple of speakers who talked a little bit about the downside of data and analytics, some of the concerns around privacy and unintended consequences and so on and so forth. Um, it feels like healthcare is one of those areas that's very sensitive mm -hmm. uh, to these kinds of issues. So I'm just curious, um, what are your thoughts about that? And in your own life and work and practice in this area, what are some of the potential issues that you've wrestled with and how, how have you resolved them? Yeah, so I'll start with a, a little while ago when I was a professor. Um, you know, I was working on prosthetics, which allows people who can't walk now to be able to walk, or people who can't move their arms to be able to move. And then there was an ethics issue that we ran into, which was 
at what point do we cross augmenting to enhancing? Um, and you know, I think that's an interesting boundary. How much can technology really truly assist? And at some point, what, what kind of regulation and policies need to be in place to prevent what's considered to be an, an enhancement to happen? Or do we embrace to a certain extent? Right? So I think it was really interesting, even interesting in the Olympics to have prosthetic leg that might be a little more springy and then allow people to run a little faster. At what point is that okay? And at what point why it's not okay, right? So I think those are the kind of things I think it's really interesting to balance and think about in one dimension, which is you know, something we didn't have to think about before. Um, but also, just like you know, I heard that you know, the, the privacy aspects and then healthcare data is extremely private. And so from that aspect of how much um, you know, do we really lean into in the data science side, how you know, that we have to give choice, we have to give value. And you know, with that, how, then how much can we really advance? How can we make sure that those people who are scared to still benefit some, but those who lean in will be safely disrupted and the value can be so high that you know, at the end of the day, a little bit of the data sharing in a safe way might be okay. So you know, at, at Google, one of the you know, interesting area might be you know, maps. We, we drive and I can't imagine the world where I don't get to input where I'm going and then drive and it's so valuable in my life that yes, I am sharing my information to this app at this time, but it's worth it for me. It's a value right? exchange and there. Yeah, so I think I would love it so that everybody who's working on healthcare, everybody's working on the data aspect is really careful so that the value outweighs so much more than, you know, than what enables the platform to move forward. Great, great answer. So shifting gears again, uh, you know, you've obviously had this amazing career starting with tennis and the academics and these great inventions that you've been a part of. But looking back, what would you say is the craziest thing you've done in your career to date? Phew. Uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> thanks for laughing. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I hope that I did a lot of crazy things, but I would say that the thing that I'm proud of that I did, and then it's crazy, is that I have four kids, and then I had, they were between six and 13, and I did that throughout my career. And I think it's completely crazy, but it's super doable, and I need all of you to be doing that. <laughs> be great examples that, you know, what's impossible can be done. It's not perfect. But uh, that was crazy, and I'll continue to do it. There's a lot of crazy people in this room by that standard, I yeah. think. <laughs> we can job. really relate. Good job. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, it's always good to just, uh, people like you, who people hold up in esteem and so on, if you had to give one piece of advice to this uh, group of um, aspiring women and data scientists around, you know, thinking about how to direct their careers and their energy, uh, any advice about how to be an awesome inventor uh, and somebody who you know, has achieved, I think the goal you set out to, which is to work on stuff that matter and that, um, that change people's lives. What would your advice be to these women around the world? Oh boy! Uh, Tough one. How many can I give? No, just kidding. You can give. No, no, no. Yeah, uh, so, analyst. Actually, no, no. I'll, let me see if I can do two. So, given this is a data science meeting, um, one area is that we all love, you know, data. We love that machine learning and technology. It's easy to think of a really cool technology and then say, ooh, I wonder what this technology can do to change lives. I would like you to flip that completely upside down, and I would like you to start with the mission. I would like you to say, what are the problems in the world that absolutely have to be changed? And you know, can you individually, given all the amazing background that you've had so far and all the education that you've got so far, what are the unique things that you can do to change the world towards that mission? 
and then think of the technology. Um, it's, you know, like we fight all the time. I'm at Google, I work with incredible data scientists every day, and they come up with amazing ideas. And it's easy to say, oh my God, that's so amazing. What can we do with that? Then you have to say, no, 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 wait. Okay, let's start with mission. So I think that would be an advice, especially women. Like, we're so mission driven. Uh, we'll, I think you're capable of thinking that way and would we'll like you to just infect the world by just repeating that. Just start with the mission, then let's fit technology. So I think that's one. Um, the other one <laughs> is um, making mistakes. It's, you know, data science, machine learning. I've been in a field of robotics which was hyped by Hollywood. It has you know, stumbled, fallen, you know, uh, criticized, and then come back up, and then, you know, it has its own phase. Data science is one of those that everybody thinks this is it. And, you know, so is it hyped? A little bit. Is it going to change the world? Absolutely, but it's gonna take time, and many of you will fail many times to get to that point of having something absolutely amazing. And, but if we don't fail, we don't learn. And it's, I teach this to my kids all the time, like failure feels like the end of the world. But I think that if you know a woman named Brené Women, bring that inner Brené Woman in you uh, to say, when you fall down, those are the best moments. You should cherish it. Say, thank God I failed, otherwise I would have never learned. I feel like I can't get up and go to work tomorrow, but I'm still gonna go to work. And I'm going to restart. And that, I think that celebration, if mistake, has to happen a lot more in this field where that all eyes are on you. All eyes are on you on the area that they think that you guys are far more capable of what you actually might be at this very moment. That is terrific advice. And I wanna thank you so much, Yoki, for joining us today and for taking your time out to be here at WIDS. Yeah, thanks, Laurie, it was fun. Thank you.